Bertrand Bariri de Vuzic, the 10th of September 1755 to the 13th of January 1841, was a French politician, Freemason, journalist, and one of the most prominent members of the National Convention during the French Revolution. Topic: Early life. Bertrand Bariri was born in Tarbes, a commune part of the Gascony region. The name Bariri de Vuzic, by which he continued to call himself long after the abolition of feudalism in France, originated from a small fief belonging to his father, Jean Bariri, who was a lawyer at Vuzic now Argelis Gazost. Barrier's mother, Jean Catherine Marast, was of old nobility. Barrier attended parish school when he was a child, and by the time he was of age, his brother, Jean-Pierre, became a priest. Three, Jean-Pierre would later earn a spot in the Council of 500 alongside the very men who discarded any notion of accepting Bertrand Barrier as a member. After finishing parish school, Barrier attended a college before delving into his career in revolutionary politics. In 1770, he began to practice as a lawyer at the Parliament of Toulouse, one of the most celebrated parliaments of the kingdom. Bariri practiced as an advocate with considerable success and wrote some small pieces, which he sent to the principal literary societies in the south of France. His fame as an essayist was what led to his election as a member of the Academy of Floral Games of Toulouse in 1788. This body held a yearly meeting of great interest to the whole city, at which flowers of gold and silver were awarded for odes, idols, and eloquence. Although Bariri never received any of these bounties, one of his performances was mentioned with honor. At the Academy of Floral Games of Montauban, he was awarded many prizes, including one for a panegyric on King Louis XII, and another for a panegyric on Frank de Pompignan. Shortly after, Bariri wrote a dissertation on an old stone with three Latin words engraved on it. This earned him a seat in the Toulouse Academy of Sciences, Inscriptions, and Polite Literature. In 1785, Bariri married a young lady of considerable fortune. In one of his works entitled Melancholy Pages, Bariri proclaims that his marriage was one of the most unhappy of marriages. In 1789, he was elected deputy by the estates of Bigoré to the estates general. He had made his first visit to Paris in the preceding year. Bariri de Vuzic at first belonged to the Constitutional Party, but he was less known as a speaker in the National Constituent Assembly than as a journalist. According to François-Victor Alphonse Allard, Barrier's paper, The Point du Jour, owed its reputation not so much to its own qualities as to the depiction of Barrier in the tennis court oath sketch. The painter, Jacques-Louis David, illustrated Barrier kneeling in the corner and writing a report of the proceedings for posterity. Political career 1789 Bariri was elected to the Estates General in 1789 and elected Judge of the Constituent Assembly in 1791. Four, soon after the King's flight to Varennes, June 1791, Bariri joined the Republican Party and the Fuyants. However, he continued to keep in touch with the Duke of Orléans, whose natural daughter, Pamela, he tutored. After the Constituent Assembly ended its session, he was nominated one of the judges of the newly instituted Cower de Cassation from October 1791 to September 1792. In September 1792 he was elected to the National Convention for the Département of the Hautes Pyrenees. Five Barrer held membership as a Girondist. He was a member of the Constitution Committee that drafted the Girondin Constitutional Project, served as presiding officer in the National Convention and chaired the trial of Louis XVI in December 1792-January 93, 7 he voted with the Mountain for the King's execution, without appeal and without delay, and closed his speech with, The tree of liberty grows only when watered by the blood of tyrants. On 7 April 1793, Bariri was elected to the Committee of Public Safety. A member of the Plain, who was unaligned with either the Mountain or the Girondins, he was the first member elected to the Committee of Public Safety and one of two members with Robert Lindet, who served on it during its entire existence. In this role he utilized his eloquence and popularity within the convention to serve as the voice of the committee. 
Of 923 orders signed by the Committee of Public Safety in the fall of 1793, Bariri was the author or first signatory on 244, the second most behind Carnot, with the majority of his orders dealing with police activities. Despite his popularity, Bariri was regarded by more extreme revolutionaries as a vacillating politician without true revolutionary ideals. There's dissension among historians about Barrier's party alignment. Encyclopædia Britannica 1911 stated that at some point after the 7th of April 1793 Barrier joined the party of Robespierre Montagnards, but Palmer 1949 analyzed that his commitment to the revolution rather than any distinct faction separated him from other major revolutionary figures. Jean-Paul Meret used the very last edition of his paper Publicité de la République Française no. 242, the 14th of July 1793 to attack Bariri directly. There is one whom I regard as the most dangerous enemy of the nation, I mean Bariri. I'm convinced that he plays both sides of every issue until he sees which one is coming out ahead. He has paralyzed all vigorous efforts, he enchains us in order to strangle us. Bariri on 5 September 1793 incited the French National Convention with a speech glorifying terror. The aristocrats of internal affairs are since many days meditating a movement. Oh well. They'll have it, that movement, but they'll have it against them. It will be organized, regularized by a revolutionary army that at last will fulfill that great word that it owes to the Paris Commune, let's make terror the order of the day." Bariri voted for the death of the Girondists in October 1793. His role as the chief communicator throughout the reign of terror, combined with his lyrical eloquence, led to his nickname, Anacreon of the Guillotine. He then became active in the power struggles between the mountain and others, and became mediator to all. Ideas, philosophy After January 1793, Bariri began publicly speaking of his newfound faith in «la religion de la patrie». He wanted everyone to have faith in the fatherland, and called for the people of the Republic to be virtuous citizens. Bariri mainly focused on four aspects about «la religion de la patrie». The belief that a citizen would be consecrated to the fatherland at birth, the citizen should then come to love the fatherland, the republic would teach the people virtues, and the fatherland would be the teacher to all. Bariri went on to state that, "...the republic leaves the guidance of your first years to your parents, but as soon as your intelligence is developed, it proudly claims the rights that it holds over you. You are born for the republic and not for the pride or the despotism of families." He also claimed that because citizens were born for the Republic, they should love it above anything else. Barra reasoned that eventually the love for the fatherland would become a passion in everyone and this is how the people of the Republic would be united. Ten, Bariri also urged further issues of nationalism and patriotism. He said, I was a revolutionary. I am a constitutional citizen. He pushed for freedom of press, speech, and thought. Bariri felt that nationalism was founded by immeasurable emotions that could only be awakened by participating in national activities such as public events, festivals, and through education. He believed in unity through diversity and compromise. In 1793 and 1794, Bariri focused on speaking of his doctrine, which included the teaching of national patriotism through an organized system of universal education, the national widespread of patriotic devotion, and the concept that one owed his nation his services. Twelve, Bariri also stated that one could serve the nation by giving his labor, wealth, counsel, strength, and or blood. Therefore, all sexes and ages could serve the fatherland. He outlined his new faith in the fatherland, which replaced the national state religion, Catholicism. Bariri was trying to make nationalism a religion. Besides being concerned for the fatherland, Bariri believed in universal elementary education. His influence on education is seen in American schools today as they recite the Pledge of Allegiance, and teach the alphabet and the multiplication table. Nine, Bariri believed that the fatherland could educate all. Thermidor, prison, and later life As 1794 progressed, tensions mounted inside the Committee of Public Safety as well as with other committees and the convention's representatives on mission. 
Some members of the Committee of Public Safety, such as Jean-Marie Collet d'Herbois and B.O. Varenne, had pursued aggressive campaigns of terror. Another clique on the committee, consisting of Robespierre, Couthon, and Saint-Just believed in their own vision of the direction of the revolution. In his memoirs written years later about this time, Bariri described the Committee of Public Safety of having at least three factions, the experts, consisting of Lazare Carnot, Robert Lindet, and Pierre-Louis Prier, the high hands, consisting of Robespierre, Couthon, and Saint-Just, and the true revolutionaries consisting of B.O. Varenne, Collet, and Bariri himself. At the same time, the Committee of General Security, nominally the Police Committee of the National Convention, had seen its place superseded by the Law of 22 Prairial, leaving members like Marc Guillaume Alexis Vadir and Jean Pierre André Amar concerned for their status. These were the laws that led to the streamlining of the Revolutionary Tribunal and the Great Terror, in which there were more executions in the final seven weeks before 9 Thermidor by the Paris Tribunal than in the previous 14 months. Finally, aggressive representatives on mission, including Joseph Fouché, Paul Barris, and Jean Lambert Tallien, had been recalled to Paris to face scrutiny for their actions in the countryside and all feared for their safety. In this atmosphere, Bariri attempted to forge a compromise between these splintering factions. On 4 Thermidor, Bariri offered to help the enforce the Ventos decrees in exchange for an agreement to not pursue a purge of the National Convention. These decrees, a program of property confiscation that had seen little support in the previous four months, was received with cautious optimism by Couthon and Saint Just. However, the following day, at a joint meeting of the committees, Robespierre once again proclaimed his dedication to purging the committees of potential, though unnamed, enemies. Robespierre continued down this path until 8 Thermidor, when he gave a famous oration alluding to multiple threats within the National Convention. However, to his surprise, Robespierre was pushed for more evidence by members of the Committee of General Security. This led to a fierce debate and a lack of support from the deputies of the plane, both of which Robespierre was not used to. After being ejected from the Jacobin Club that night, Collet and B.O. Varenne returned to the Committee of Public Safety to find Saint just at work on a speech for the next day. Though Bariri had been pushing Saint Just to give a speech regarding the new unity of the committees, both Collet and B.O. Varenne assumed he was working on their final denunciation. This led to the final fracturing of the Committee of Public Safety, and a heated argument ensued, in which Bariri allegedly insulted Couthon, Saint Just, and Robespierre, saying, Who are you then, insolent pygmies, that you want to divide the remains of our country between a cripple, a child, and a scoundrel? I wouldn't give you a farmyard to govern. The final pieces of the plot fell into place that night. On 9 Thermidor, as Saint Just rose to give his planned speech, he was interrupted by Tallien and B.O. Varenne. After some denunciations of Robespierre, a cry went up for Bariri to speak. A possibly apocryphal tale held that as Bariri rose to speak he held two speeches in his pocket, one for Robespierre and one against him. Here Bariri played his role in 9 Thermidor, by submitting a bill that would blunt the ability of the Paris Commune to be used as a military force. Unfortunately, Bariri was still questioned on the grounds of being a terrorist. Before Bariri was sentenced to prison, Carnot defended him on the ground that Bariri was hardly worse than himself. However, the defense proved ineffective. Nonetheless, in Germinal of the Year 3, March 21 to April 4, 1795, the leaders of Thermidor decreed the arrest of Bariri and his colleagues in the Reign of Terror, Jean-Marie Collet d'Herbois and Jacques Nicolas B. Overen. Bariri was sentenced for his betrayal of King Louis XVI by voting to execute him, for being a traitor to France, and for being a terrorist. He was imprisoned in Oléron as he was being transported to French Guiana. Barrier's increasing depression while in prison led him to write his own epitaph. Bariri was in prison for two years before the National Convention decided they were going to retry him for death by the guillotine. When Bariri found out that he was being retried, his cousin, Hector Bariri, and a young man helped him escape prison. Bariri refused to reveal the name of the latter in fear that he would be executed. Although Bertrand Bariri was reluctant to escape, his two friends believed that he should leave at the earliest opportunity. The original plan was to escape over the garden walls or from the dormitory with the help of a long rope ladder. This plan soon proved impossible as it was discovered that the garden was out of barrier's reach and that the dormitory was closed. The escape plan was soon reconfigured, as it was decided that Barrieri would escape by the cloister and garden of the convent. 
Bariri escaped and went to Bordeaux, where he lived in hiding for several years. In 1795, he was elected to the Directory's Council of 500, but he was not allowed to take his seat. However, Bariri served Napoleon. Under the First Empire, he was used as a secret agent by Napoleon, for whom he carried on a diplomatic correspondence. Some time afterward, Napoleon placed Bariri back in prison, but Bariri escaped again. He became a member of the Chamber of Deputies during the Hundred Days, but was a royalist in 1815. However, once the final restoration of the Bourbons was achieved, he was banished from France for life, as a regicide. Bariri then withdrew to Brussels, where he lived until 1830. He returned to France and served Louis Philippe under the July Monarchy until his death on January 13, 1841. He was the last surviving member of the Committee of Public Safety. See also Society of the Friends of Truth <laughs> Notes <laughs>